solve is learning how to love yourself. That's kind of the bottom line. If you can learn how to figure out all of your flaws. Now, I have a lot of flaws that I'm still working through. Amen. I've had a lot of experiences in my life that were negative, but uh, in spite of, I still do my best to reach whomever I can reach. Amen. I can't reach everybody. Obviously, that's why you're here, because you guys know more people that I don't know. So that's why you're called to those those people. Amen. So tonight, as we go through the word, you know, just kind of remember now, anytime you hear a sermon, don't look around the room and say, oh, yeah, that's for you. <laughs> you should be, according to the word, examining yourself and saying, okay, how does this apply to me? How can I get better so I can be better for somebody else? Now, one of the rules that Jesus left, you know, it wasn't really a rule or a law, but it, you know, a lot of people like to say it's the law of love. And he says, you know, love God as you love your neighbor, right? But more importantly, as you love yourself. You need to love yourself. So how do you love yourself when you're the one that made all those mistakes? And secondary to that is how do we love ourselves when we're constantly blaming somebody else for all the mistakes that we made? Wait a minute. The common denominator is you. Yeah. So if you're going to fault somebody else, their vacancy or their rejection, how I many you know that it's not going to really work for you? It's just a tactic that the enemy uses. How I many of you come from a broken home? You know, and I'm not saying maybe single parent, but just broken because of people's brains are all broken in the house. Yeah. I, I come from a similar uh, background like that. And the one thing I had to address as I was getting older, in the midst of all the problems that I went through as a child, I had to come to a, a point in my adulthood and say, you know what, I got to stop blaming everybody else. Because this life, they're not here no more. You know, once you move out of your parents' house, some of you moved out early. You move out, how many know that you cannot blame nobody? It's you now. It's on you. How do you do it? You cannot be codependent on things, right? I always say, and the studies have proven this out, that we always medicate back to an age where we feel like we got hurt the most. So we get stuck in an age bracket. Now, for me, a lot of my problems started when I was five years old. So at times, I got to remind myself, hey... I act like a five-year-old sometimes. I know, biggest five-year-old you ever met. Some of you are like five years old. You're way older than me. You better watch out. But you see, if you look at a person, their hurt or their pain or their anguish or their misery, if you look, check the behavior because you may be dealing with a teenager or a preteen or even a toddler at times. Now, if you look at this person, remember something. Don't blame the behavior. Try and pray for the greater good in healing of who they got stagnant at or stuck at. Some of you, you, you were a late bloomer, so 19, 20, you got hurt. You know, you still act like a 19 or 20-year-old. Some of you, when you're 10, you stuck at 10. And then you try and stuff your body with all kinds of things to try and medicate. Now, I don't care what your medicine was because um, the trade-off word for medicine is addiction. Hallelujah. Now, if you look around, especially in the mirror, look at yourself and say, what am I addicted to? Hmm. Hallelujah. And you'll kind of figure it out. Just trace back in your, in your history and see where you're stuck. Now, don't try and analyze somebody else and say, oh, you stuck at 12 because I know you. Cause you know you. And you're like, whoa. Calm down. Check yourself. Amen. Everybody will be the better for it if you check yourself. If you're checking other people, I mean, are you still deflecting and blaming somebody else? You're trying not to look into the mirror of yourself. All right. So when we talk about change, this is kind of that kind of message tonight, the five enemies of change, basically. All right. Hallelujah. All right. Let's read the, the opener here. It says, change is something we all desire but find to be the most difficult thing to accomplish as a human is that true change how many of you always say i, I want to change but and then you you insert your medicine of choice right however it is necessary for reaching our destiny if we are not changing we are not growing there are five enemies to our personal change and what are they read them pride fear rebellion laziness and Ignorance. Identifying these hindrances in your life and committing to getting rid of them will put you on the path to change. How many of you want to learn something like this and say, well, I want to address some of the things that are important? Well, these are it, you know. I deal with people every day. 
Amen. The most difficult person I deal with every day is myself. Because there's the, there's the public defender that always rises up and says, I don't want to. You know, sometimes when I have a meeting, you know, days in advance, I make an appointment with somebody. When it comes to that morning, sometimes I'm like, I tell myself, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with their problem. I want to deal with mine. And the Lord says, no, as you help them through theirs, you will identify your own. So I got to look at it. <sighs> hey Amen. How many of you have those kind of days? <sighs> I don't like, but I'm going to do them because of you, God. Oh, okay. God's really impressed with that. Anyway, Romans 12, we can look at that scripture first because, you know, we like to look at the word. Amen. And when you read Romans 12, many of you have memorized this. And this is Paul, right, talking to the church at Rome. Now, you know that this is, this is the precursor to the Catholic Church. So, I mean, you know that the, the church in Rome was pretty hard-headed. Hallelujah. And he says to them, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. I mean, you know that what he's saying is don't lay yourself on the altar of sacrifice and kill yourself. What he's saying is live a life of example because people are watching. They're learning from you. All right, that's the greatest example is if you can fix you, everybody else gets fixed because they want to emulate who you've become. All right, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I mean, you know, there are some reasonable things. Being a good example is reasonable to God. All right, you guys know what reasonable is? Like if you're shopping and you see something, well, gas is $4, and then on the next corner, it's three ninety-five. Which one is more reasonable? Well, some of you would say, well, depend on the line. <laughs> well, which line is more reasonable to you, right? It's like shopping for milk in this town. How many of you have done that? Right? You get all kinds of prices, and they know it's a necessity, so the more popular the store, usually the more high the price, right? Because they're going to make you pay because you're there anyway. Remember, the cows don't know the difference. You know, when the cow getting milk, you know, say, this is prime milk. You better get $5. Yeah. All the milk is the same. It all depends on the cost structure on the way down. Amen. And then verse 2, Paul says this, and do not be conformed to this world. Right? You guys know what conforming to the world is? You just kind of ride along with the wave and just say, ah, whatever goes, whatever goes. I, you know if the common theme of the day is partying and then you go with your friends and you party, well, what is reasonable? Remember, people are watching. Right? You cannot say, you cannot be, okay, I'm going to mimic somebody like this. And he said, oh, God, I love God, you know. Is that reasonable? <laughs> Everybody, how many ever believed a drunk? <laughs> but you know that more truth comes out of a drunk than an undrunk person. <laughs> But they get over-exuberant in their love for everybody, right? I love you, bro. Like, okay, tell me when you're sober. You know what I mean? Hallelujah. Everybody get the love bug as soon as they get some drinks in there, man. Hallelujah. Okay. Reasonable service. <laughs> Don't be conformed to it. How many of you do this and you... Okay, I'm going to throw this out here. I don't know why, but some of you are holding a drink and you see a Christian person. Uh, you know, like she said, purpose, purpose on purpose should drink. But sometimes there's that one Christian where you're like, oops, back pocket. Anyway, well... You know, you got to be, the Bible says instant in season and out of season. It means instant meaning you got to be ready to serve the Lord in and out of season. So you cannot be, oh, God, you need prayer. <laughs> That's not me. <laughs> yeah, basically, you know. Some of you hide it out of polite behavior. Like you're trying not to endorse that. But. You know, the thing is, just relax, man. You know, you shouldn't get to the point where you forget your name. You cannot get to the point where you start throwing things out that you don't really mean. Hey, man, you know that alcohol is the truth serum, man. You start calling everybody on all their flaws. Like, yeah, you know you, man. 
alone. I think you should stop drinking right now. Oh, yeah. Now, on occasion, I've been known to taste or sample one or whatever. It doesn't matter, right? But you'll never see me down in a case. Not in your presence. <laughs> uh, I gave up that life a long time ago. You know why? Because I got more tight as I got older. I look at the cost of that, I'm like, I'd rather drink milk at $5. At least I get one gallon rather than to drink one gallon beer. The price is astronomical. At least with milk, it's healthier. So he said, no, beer is healthy. Yeah, if you're trying to expand your waistline, yeah. Hallelujah. Don't be conformed to this world, right? but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There's that word acceptable again and reasonable. You see, those are sister words, reasonable, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Oh, you know, no, what is acceptable to God is for you to operate in peace in all things. I'll say it is. If you operate in the peace of God, you eliminate the pieces of life that seem to get lost along the way. All right, you guys all good with that? All right, so in your notes now. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. All right, you guys see it? What is A? If you're writing these down, it's good, good practice for you to kind of remind yourself what you learned tonight. The only way to change is by renewing, by renewing your mind with God's Word. Amen. So how do, you, how do you learn the Word of God? Well, simply put, yeah, don't read it like a book, right? Pick it apart, see what it's saying to you. All right? Some of you are like, mm. well, Pastor, when I read the Bible, it just something don't make sense to me. Well, you have to have a point of reference, and our point of reference in this church is we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we're not looking for penalty. We're looking for provision. And we are also not looking at what we can get. We're looking at what we already have. So if you take that standpoint, I can tell you right now, you are probably, man, I would say 75% ahead of the pack in Christianity. Because most Christians are taught that if, and this is how they look at things, if I do this, God going to do that. But this is what God is saying. I already did this. This is what you have. All right? Don't look at the penalty part. Like, oh, uh, God is going to pound me out. If I, well, what? Pound, pound out what? You know what? I mean, all right. So number one here, acquiring more knowledge doesn't mean your mind is being renewed. You know, there's only, you know the truth, the word says, right? And the truth will set you free. So how much truth is going to set you free? How much truth do you need to be set free? Eh, well... You're only as set free as you believe you're set free, right? Hallelujah. I get people all the time, they have like a broken leg, and they say, Pastor, pray that my leg get healed right now. Okay, well, I've seen it get healed instantly, but then there's times where the Lord just wants some alone time with you, and you're going to have to sit through a healing whether you like it or not. And, and besides, if, if you had a broken leg and got healed instantly, what would you do next? Probably the thing that got you the broken leg anyway. And anyway, uh, I don't know about you, but this one guy, he was playing soccer down Bayfront. He kicked and he had a compound fracture in his shin, right? You guys know what a compound fracture is? Yeah, when your bone looked like one chopstick that you just broke at the Chinese restaurant. And he was telling me, oh, I need this to be healed. I said, okay, I prayed. All right, the only thing didn't heal was the, compound, the, the exit wound where the bones came out of the skin. So his bones got healed. Instantly he's like, wow, this is amazing. And he went out and he went play soccer again and broke his leg again. Okay, so how many know that you still need an ounce of healing, right? You, need, you still need to pay attention, right? All right. Now, some of you have a hard time believing some of these stories that I have. But remember, I do ministry to a lot of people every single day. So I can, may, I can get or gather maybe 6 to 20 stories a day. And do I hear some craziness out there? Hallelujah. You wouldn't believe the level of insanity in our city. <laughs> you know, get some real low lows living amongst you. <laughs> 
Alright, and hopefully you not the low low of the day. Amen. Now renewing your mind is an ongoing process that takes place by applying the word of God to your thinking so your mindset can change. Now everything in God is about changing your mindset. Because the one thing that got activated in the Garden of Eden to his detriment was Adam's negative mindset. All right, how did that get, ha- get into place? Well, there's two trees in the garden, right? Basically, they're the name by name. God said, you can eat of all the trees, but he identifies two trees. The tree of life, right? We all know the tree of life. I mean, you know that he was pretty much telling Adam that you are a tree of life. Amen. You have a root system. Everything's good. And then he pointed out another tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. How do you know that the knowledge of good and evil only exists in your mindset? Hmm. If you're writing these things down. So let me ask you for review purposes. (laughs) Where does the knowledge of good and evil reside? In your mind. Because in anything, right? In anything. If you look at the sky and you say, it's a beautiful day. And somebody who's negative stands next to you, they could look at the same sky and say, too cloudy. Well, let's say it's a really beautiful day, no more clouds. And you say, it's a beautiful day. And this person who's negative looks at it and says, too hot. Right? In anything, right, a mindset is what fuels any conversation, right? Because you all know, you all had a conversation with somebody today. How many of you got a little perturbed with somebody you were talking to? Think about it because if you're talking to somebody, hey, so how are you doing? You don't really mean you want to know how they're doing. You're just doing it because you just want to make conversation. You're hoping they say, oh, I'm good. But nine times out of ten, they will tell you, well, I'm glad you asked, but since you're asking, I'm all right, but... And then they start going down this laundry list of crap that they're going through. And before you know it, you are exhausted beyond belief. You're like, wow, all I wanted to hear was you say, I'm good. Well, you see, you just got to be careful, right? These people can set the tone for your day. You start work at 7 o'clock. By 7.01, you're totally drained, Right? And then you have another eight hours to go with these people. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know. It's always good to just smile and nod and walk away. And just say good morning so you remind them that it is a good morning. Now, good morning. How are you? Oh, you just opened up, especially if this is a low self-esteem person who has no ego. They're going to just talk your ears off. Amen. You're going to walk away with dabbing at your ears wondering if they're bleeding. Well, some people have that effect on people. Amen. And the next one here, on the evidence that your mind is renewed is when you don't respond in the same way to old temptations. Now, I get this all the time. People, they have exes and they meet up with their exes and then all of a sudden they do the things they used to do when they was married. And they tell them, I made a mistake. I know that tornado that ripped all your clothes off was incredible. You were in the wrong place at the wrong time. What? <laughs> uh, one guy told me this. Ah, it's just old clothes from the closet. I try on again. What? Ah, you shouldn't even do stupid stuff like that. That's craziness. All right. So again, number three. Read this. The evidence again that your mind is renewed is don't respond in the same way to old temptations. Amen. All right. Now, if you are a drug addict, I mean, you know that if you get tempted with drugs, the worst thing you can possibly do is start up again. Now, if you're diabetic, what got you there was probably sugar. And somebody says, hey, man, I just ran into this whole box of text drive-in. I want to bless you with it. And you're looking at this sugar-coated, Bavarian-filled, chocolate cream-filled warm deal and you're saying to yourself even though you're diabetic and you get high blood pressure high cholesterol you're saying to yourself well i can't turn down a blessing (laughs) amen it happens you know it happens right it happens so uh, don't get tempted amen 
No, you, instead of the whole box, you say, no, I take six. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and share five and three quarters with somebody. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Hawaii people, we love to bless with food. Yeah. Yeah, well, hallelujah. Don't be the detriment to somebody's temptation. You know? Okay, next one here. We are to dedicate our bodies to God as a sacrifice. So how I many you know that wherever you go, now it's not saying that you're going to dress like an Amish person. Amen. You're not going to dress like an Eskimo walking around here because you don't like show off your body. That's not what it means. It means that people are watching, so just be mindful that they're, they're not watching you per se. They're watching your behavior. Because you know everybody knows you go to church because this is one of the first things that comes out of your mouth. Oh, man, you got to come check out my church, you know. And then you proceed to act a fool. Hallelujah. Don't say the name of the church if you plan to act a fool. Okay? Let them wonder. And please don't mention my church if you're out acting a fool. Amen. All right. And when we renew our minds, we prove what is acceptable to God. Amen? Because you make good decisions, right? I know some people, they, I, oh, you're not going to believe this. This lady, she goes to the movies all the time. She makes a regular habit of going to the movies at least once a week, sometimes twice. And she, she tells me at times, can you pray for me? I, I get diarrhea. Now, I don't mean to be rude and crude. I said, okay, well, man, you better go have that checked out. You know, she said, well... I don't know if this has anything to do with it, but I eat plenty of popcorn when I go to movies. And then I, I drink soda and I eat cocky mochi and then I eat candy, not a big box candy. But I don't buy them from the movies, it's too expensive. So I buy them from Sears or I buy them from Walmart. And she's telling me she has the runs. I'm like, okay, let's examine what the number one ingredient is. You know, they make popcorn and coconut oil, right? So coconut oil is very rich. Amen. Coconut oil, if it has a choice, it wants to be coconut oil right away. Right when you go in your mouth, it wants to be coconut oil again on the other side. Yeah. So I told her that, and it was revelation to her. She's like, really? So you know what she does now, right? She sneaks her own popcorn in the theater that she makes at home. Then she tells me, pray that they don't search me at the door. Yeah, Pastor. I said, the worst thing they're going to do is that you know, bring them in, but you're the number one customer if you go in once a week. She goes, oh, yeah, that's true. I know everybody over there. People are crazy. <laughs> crazy. Yeah. She likes to eat that cookie dough bite things. Yeah, you know what cookie dough. Yeah, get, what has in cookie dough? Uh, hmm, let me think. Oh. Raw eggs, oh, um, oil, oh, sugar, oh, chocolate. Oh. Yeah, that wouldn't give you the runs. See, let me share this with you. All of you can figure out your own problems pretty re readily and regularly if you just pay attention to your lifestyle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Y'all good? All right. The word must go... Deep in your spirit. How I many you know you have a spirit man inside? You, you, when you read the word and you pray, all you're doing is making this person strong on the inside. So when life's problems come, your spirit can take over. Some of you are so weak in spirit, like, oh, I don't know why I mean. That means your head is more big than your spirit. All right? If you have that kind of problem where you're constantly having a party called pity, then your mind is way more active than your spirit, man. Yeah? You see, we just figured out a mystery. You know, like, if you're a chronic complainer, how you know your head is bigger than your spirit? If you keep getting in trouble, that means your head is more strong than your spirit. So my advice to you is pray in the Holy Ghost more. I don't know how. Well, you better ask for help. Okay, plenty of people in here would pray in the Holy Ghost with you and help you develop that. Now, as we look at Hebrews 4.12, this is something, you know, it's one of the more important verses that I like personally. All right. All right. Read that now. For the Word of God. So it's going to define for you what the Word of God is. The Word of God is living and powerful. 
So it's alive. Is the Word of God alive? Well, it's alive. So how is it alive? Remember, John 1, 14 says, Jesus is the Word that came to earth and became flesh. So he's the living Word of God. So when you read the Word, you study the Word, you're actually partaking of Jesus. He's alive. Hey, I mean, you know, you live in the Word. You live in Jesus. What? And it's also powerful, full of power, and sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, you know a two-edged sword can cut going in and coming out, right? It can cut you both ways, left or right, in and out, right, top to bottom. So how do you know that the Word does that? It separates things. So what does it separate? Even to piercing, even to the division of soul and spirit. So I just told you that your head is more strong than your spirit, so what do you need to slice away some stuff? The Word of God. It needs to come and cut away that soulish realm. You guys all know what a soulish realm is? If you have parked your buns in this church for any length of time, you've found out and learned that the soul is your mind. Spirit, spirit soul. Okay. So your body is, I mean, no, your body is okay based on your mind. But if your mind not okay, your body not okay. If your spirit is okay, the other two can fall into line. All right. So what is, your, what is this soul realm made up of? You guys? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. So look at the three things. Your mind is your soul. Your will is part of your soul. And your emotions are part of your soul. So whenever you are given over to a more powerful mind and spirit, just take a look at what's going to happen. Yeah? What's going to be activated? Ah, your mind gets activated. I mean, you know, your, your thinker starts to dictate the words that come out of you. So you become symptomatic. Symptomatic meaning you're speaking into whatever's trying to ail you. Uh, uh, your will is a funny thing because all the enemy is trying to do is give your will back over to him or deny the will that you're living in in God. Amen? So your will is important, Right? And your emotions, how many you know emotional people? They can always, well, if they're like that, how many you know that their head is bigger than their spirit? Automatic. So how many you know that as a church, collectively, we all need to start reinforcing and building up our spirit man? Building up your spirit man, there's some things that you can do. You know, giving is one of those things that plugs in your plug to God. And then you go on from there, and then you migrate in, and you start studying the Word and praying, serving others. You know, those are important components. Many of you come to be served. Well, you need to flip that around and start to serve. Okay? When you serve others, you're denying your own personal comforts to help out. Why? Because you want to be a servant of all. Jesus came as a servant of all. So if we want to mimic and emulate his behavior, we need to start serving other people. Now, I'm not saying that you got to walk around and... Yeah, <laughs> All you got to do is look for things that need to be done. That's the ultimate service to the Lord. Amen. If you see a piece of paper like right here in the middle of the carpet, you know, somebody obviously dropped that, not voluntarily, probably involuntarily, but voluntarily as a servant, you go and you pick it up. Amen. That's the important. Is that reasonable service? If somebody sees you do that, what happens? Now, you men, I'll just share this with you. You know, men are a funny creature, right? Uh, sometimes no can aim straight. But... One thing I was taught as a child was that, you know, when you're done doing your business, especially in a toilet, not really a urinal, in a toilet, you got some paper and you wipe and clean up and then flush it down. Is that reasonable service? Because you leave things better than you found them. And some of you are like, oh, I don't like even that's biohazard action. I don't like, you know, I don't like catch some kind of disease or something. But you don't want left them for everybody. But if everybody starts from the beginning of a clean bathroom all the way to you, how many know that you will receive this bathroom clean? So you leave it clean for the next person. How easy is that? The true sign of hygiene and cleanliness. How many of you brush your teeth every day? Yeah. Praise the Lord. That's a majority. I'm... If you go to anybody's house, just take a look at their bathroom mirror. Some of you like to floss an art project on your mirror. Some of you like to brush so hard that you get spots all over the place. When I go to somebody's house and I ultimately use the bathroom, that's the first thing that catches my eye. 
Because if it's there, it's here. Now I can't touch anything. Right? So, hallelujah. <laughs> now, you know that some people, they invite me to their house and they have these set of towels in their bathroom that is off limits. Because well, that thing look brand new, right? So, when I got a white pan, what do you think I do? I'm a very hygienic guy, so I'll, I'll use the back of the towel. <laughs> no. I'll use the toilet paper and wipe my hand because obviously they don't want me to touch the, those mementos from great grandma, you know. That's another thing that I like to do is I like to flick the towels boom, and then look at the light and see how much dust come out. Because this is me. I'm a little quirky like that. Huh? I'm not, I'm not anal retentive and I'm not OCD kind of obsessive compulsive person. But I like clean things, amen? So people know that. They're like, one thing I cannot stand is when I look at an iPad and there's fingerprints all over. And they tell me, go, Pastor, here, check them out. Like, nah, that's okay. You, you press the button. It looked like they ate like five Snickers and wiped the chocolate all over the screen. And I don't know if that's Snickers or not. And I don't like find out. The other thing is when people invite me to the house and say, Hey, Pastor, watch whatever you like. And they throw me the remote. I'm like, that's another source of investigation. Because you know people do all manner of dastardlies yeah, with the remote in their hand. Some of you never thought of these things, for real kind? You know people, when they sit alone at home, all of a sudden they go treasure hunting. Yeah, wherever. I don't like no. See? Yeah, man. If I stick my hand in my cushion at your house in the couch, what am I going to find? Paper clips? M&M's? Crayons? Paper? Gum wrappers? Rubbish? I don't know. All right. I'm just pointing things out. Amen. Because, you know, reasonable service. Everybody got to be clean. Amen. Hallelujah. <sighs> How many of you have OCD? I'm going to come to your house. <laughs> Just take a look at these things because, you know, well, there's an old saying, right? Cleanliness is next to godliness. So, you know, it's not going to make you godly because you're clean. It's just going to be more acceptable. People are going to say, well, I like going to their house because it's very clean. And why am I leading into that? Because some of you are being called to start a Bible study at your house. Right? And you haven't because you don't like clean your house. I don't like because they're going to see all my stuff. I used to have a Bible study in my house that grew. The max was 12. At 13, you're supposed to split the group. That was when I was at this other church. And they said, you want to host a Bible study group? I said, yeah. They said, well, at 13, the rule is that when you hit 13, you split the group in half. And the, sec the secondary person that's next to you takes that second group, opens his house, and starts a group. And that's how one of these churches in Hilo got to the size it's at. Now, I, was, I invited everybody to the house. And my group grew way past 13. We had 84 at one time. And you know how beat up your house gets with 84 people? Especially when 20 of them are drunken midgets. Who cannot keep still and run all over the furniture and poke holes in your drywall. And yeah. And I told the next guy next to me, you need to go start a group and get, in fact, six of you probably need to go start a group already. And he was like, no, my house dirty. Ay, ay, ay. You know that I got labeled all kind of names because I was greedy and I wasn't willing to release people. And I was like, oh, my God. So I just stopped. I said, no, I'm just going to stop because it just got out of hand already. You know, when you're cleaning boogers off your own couch and it's not your kids or yours. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Well, I'm not trying to scare any of you off for not starting a Bible study. But keep it reasonable to people of like character. If somebody looks clean and you're clean, that's the person you are. You can tell by looking at their shoes or slip walk. No look down. You all know how you came to church tonight. If I can throw your slipper in a pot and make soup out of that. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> 
soul and spirit again. So how do you know that you just got to keep those things separate by the word. Amen. And of joints and marrow. You guys know what joints are? Joints are hard, right? And marrow is the inside. Okay. It's always talking about inner things. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You have two hearts, basically. One heart in your mind and one in your heart. Amen. In your spirit. So you have two hearts. And that's why your soul and spirit got to stay separate. You kind of mix the two. Amen. Because in one breath, you're going to say, I love you. And then there's going to be the separation going to be but. And then you're going to add, I think you're handsome, but. And then I think you're smart, but. So you got to separate those things so you don't get them in the gray area and cloud them all together and everybody hates your guts afterward. Amen. How many of you would like to start a Bible study group at your house? Don't all raise your hand all at once. After I did all that spiel, you're like, Honey, Dominic, because uh, she clean. She, if your hand went up, then you don't. You know that you're comfortable in your own home. Amen. Some of you others need to volunteer and just say, you know what? I'll start one. Amen. And then you pick a night of the week because we're trying. We're trying to play with the schedule as we move and migrate out of this building. I'm trying to play with the schedule to have two nights of Bible study groups, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and try and eliminate the Wednesday group. Uh, Wednesday church service. Sorry if you only come Wednesday. But we're trying to get people into a home cell group type of situation. So, you know, some, how many of you learn better in a small group rather than a big group? Eh, some people because a big group gets more of your attention distracted. Hey, <laughs> look then. Honey, look, look over there. You know. So in a home study group, you sit in a circle, yeah? So there's more accountability. So, you know, in the first church started house to house. So that's something we want to explore because, you know, me doing Wednesdays and Sundays is okay, but the demands for travel are starting to get a little more. In fact, I just got invited to New York City, April, um, about the 6th to the 13th or 14th, somewhere around there. So I'll be gone. And, you know, it takes its toll because some of you guys, I don't know, you your obsessive compulsive disorder and your addiction to my face. <laughs> you guys don't come. <laughs> when I, love you. I don't want them. Maybe we need to groom up some different leaders. Amen. And believe it or not, every single one of you is called to be a leader. So you just got to explore that and say, you know what? I can do it at my house. I can handle 10 to 12 people max. Amen. Once it gets to 13, then you say, okay, Whoever is, you need a leader and an associate leader because some weeks you're just not going to be there. And the associate leader can take the lead. So you trade off until you reach 13. Then you split the group in half. And then geographically, usually, then, you know, we have two groups that are growing. And we just need to explore that. So some of you really need to entertain that. Amen. And where does a group have to meet? Well, if you don't like how your house looks, then go Starbucks or someplace. Go some place, you know, I know groups that meet up all over the place. I saw one Bible study group at a Chinese restaurant. Hey Amen. You know, Kauyuk is always a good icebreaker for. Yeah, you can try that. Wonton mean. When I when I did my Bible study group, I had soup group. We did it on Friday nights, so we had soup group. So every Friday, I would make a big pot of soup, and somebody would bring bread, and we would just do that. And before you know it, some people were just coming for the soup and leaving. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, you guys can handle. Think about it, right? Now, in your notes here, the word, right? We're back at the, the, the note part of this, all right? 4A, the word is the only thing that has the power to penetrate your heart. So if you ever wondered why you're so hard with people, it's because you don't have enough word in there. You just need the word to kind of get in there and break apart the crustiness. Amen. Now, the five hindrances to change, how many of you need to fix one of these? Well, you know, you examine yourself again. What is the first one? Pride. Now, pride always says this. What does it say up there? I don't need to change. That's pride. Amen. How many of you ever got to that point when somebody says, you know you, you got to change. And you say, I don't need change. Well, you're operating in a spirit of pride. Amen. Pride and arrogance always precede destruction and a fall. And that's what it says in Proverbs 16, 18. It's no mystery. And, you know, a lot of Christians who are well-versed in the Word, or so they think. We can go to it. Let's take a look at it. They like to quote this scripture to make others look bad, right? Pride goes before 
destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That means that you're kind of hardened in heart or you're prideful in heart and attitude. And it always precedes some kind of a destruction or a fall from grace. Amen. And Christians they like to use it like, well, look, I knew that was going to happen because they were operating in pride. Well, you're operating in pride right now just by saying that. So you're expecting to fall too? You know, don't be so stupid that you're breathing the air that we need. Amen. You know, save that air for us. You lack of oxygen anyway. All right. Some people are just hard. All right. The next thing that needs to change, let's go back to the notes now. So what was the first one? Pride. 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 All right. So pride is a funny thing. The middle letter in the word pride is I. I. All right. You guys know. Pride. Hallelujah. Very good. All right. The next one is number two, fear. And what does fear say? Obviously, I'm afraid to change. You know, a lot of people are afraid to change. You know why? Because it brings about a whole other set of circumstances. You know, some people are afraid to change jobs. Why? Because now I got to get to know all kinds of different people. All, well, you should always be on the lookout for promotion. You know that God is a God of promotion and not demotion, right? right? Now, God always has your best interests at heart. He is always looking. Some people say, well, I should get way more money if I get promoted. No, 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 no. You're being promoted into a different group of people. Sometimes you've worn out your welcome with that last group. God is just moving you on into another segment of people. Now, you can't be the same person you were going into a new group. Amen. Amen? Because promotion tells you that your attitude has been promoted into a higher level of group. Now, some of the people may not be or be, they may not resemble a higher functioning group, but that's why you're there. Amen. Amen? So it may not necessarily be going to change workplace, but maybe it's just a change of duties or a change of job. It puts you with a different set of people that may be more open to the message of God than the last group was. Remember, if you're being promoted, you're coming out of some kind of impoverished place into a more prosperous place. Amen. Because sometimes you're in a group and it's stagnant. You ever been there in a workplace? You see the same old, same old. Everybody talking the same story. They all get amnesia because they're always talking about the same stuff they always talked about. And you're wondering, oh, God, oh, God, get me out of here. And then he moves you to a different group and you go, I don't like over there. Too scary. I don't know them. You can't have it both ways. Amen. Now, how many of you have a car in here? Yeah. Huh? How many of you look at the different prices on the gas pump and always choose the cheapest? And why is that? <laughs> well, you can look at it several different ways. Either I don't care about my car, I just got to feed them. Or you're looking at the price, too expensive, I go with the cheap. Or I'm not looking at this car as my last car, you know. How many know that this might be your last car? Take good care of it. Amen. Everybody, you have your own level of thinking. Am I right? If you really love your car and it's a great investment, you usually put the higher grade of gas. Why? Because you want it to run cleaner. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. One thing I like to do with all of my cars is I like to put an oil additive in the crankcase so that it helps with the wear and tear. Because I want to leave the car in better shape for the next person that gets it. Does that make sense to you? I've been known to improve little things in the engine, like putting in a, a different air filter within the air intake. I've been known to do oil additives because I want the next person that has the car to say, wow, whoever had this car took really good care of it. I don't want to be that person that tells somebody, oh, that was, hey, you're driving my old car. And they go, oh, you didn't beat this thing to hell. <laughs> Oops. You know? You always want to be that example too. So, you know, we all got to, yeah, we eliminate fear. What is the best way to eliminate fear? By always looking at prosperity first. Look at the best in life. Amen. If, if you like the best things, then the best things take care of you. Amen. 
Hallelujah. Fear is a funny thing because where you're going, not a lot of people can go with you. So sometimes people get left behind. Yeah. How many of you have had friends that had to be left behind because you changed job? Remember, if they were only your work friends, they weren't really your work friends. They weren't really friends at all. They were just people who were employed at the same place you were. You know, they're not going to be your best friend forever. So look, how many of you best friends with the people you work with at your first job? It's rare. It happens. But, you know, some people say, oh, no, that's the way it is. You know, I worked at the prison. You can guess how many people I hang out with from the prison. Zero. None. At the time, they were all my best friends. Oh, yeah, hallelujah. And after a while, you're like, man, I don't work there. They forgot about me. All right, so don't never be afraid to move on. Now, don't settle for less when God wants to give you the best. Look at this next one. What does it say? Fear keeps you from taking risks. You know, that you, another, another way to interpret the word faith is risk. Because if you operate by faith, I mean, you know, you're operating by some level of risk. Yeah. I mean, you know, it takes a lot of risk and courage to go pray for somebody when you don't know what the results will be. Like for me, I just, I'm just at the point in my ministry career where, eh, it's up to you anyway. God wants you healed. I want you healed. It's up to you. You want to be healed? Yeah, I think we can get them. We cannot be meatloaf and say two out of three ain't bad. The old time ones know what that is. Two out of three ain't bad. Anyway, that's a song, by the way. We need three out of three for success to really take place. Amen. Now, all of you in here, you have my endorsement to be rich and healthy and smart. Smart is up to you. Anybody here? Yes. Smart is a choice we make every single day. How many of you ever made a decision and said, that was the dumbest thing I ever decided? Yeah. And now you get kids from. Anyway, all right. <laughs> you guys are all smart. Amen. Ultimately, right, at the time, that was the man or woman of your dreams. Hopefully, it didn't turn into your worst nightmare. Huh? Dreams and nightmares, one is pleasant and one is not. Yeah. Uh, you got to love the life lesson in everything, right? Like I say all the time, a cat never jumps on a hot stove twice. Why? They learn. You guys heard that? One person responded. Why? Because a cat will learn. What about you? I mean, you got burned plenty of times from different people. Same scenario, but burned everything. You know, that means you like to play with hot stuff. <laughs> Leave that alone. Uh, if you are in fear, here's the truth. Torment is present. Torment is a funny thing because torment will keep you up at night. Fear is fear, but torment will just mess with your day and your night. Right? It's that white noise when you close your eyes and everything's like, <sighs> you cannot believe that would happen to you. I cannot understand why me. Uh, man, they get drugs for that. <laughs> just take a couple of sleepers and go sleep. Mm -hmm. Nothing should bother you to the point where it keeps you up at night. You know why? Because you probably went through way worse stuff in your life already. And you're worried about this? Man, I remember being three quarters of a million dollars in debt to the IRS. And then somebody came up to me. That's a problem. I cannot sleep. The IRS coming after me. I owe $3,000. I can help you sleep. You remember? To go in my tool bag. Grab that hammer. Let me help you out. <laughs> That's nothing. You know what I found out from the IRS? You call them up, you make a payment plan, they take whatever you say. Exactly. Yeah, you know why? Because the guy on the other end, no care, it's not his money. When you're talking about trillions of dollars, they don't care about your $100 payment every month. I was three quarters of a million dollars in debt to the IRS. And the guy told me, so what level of payment would you like to make every month? And I was thinking to myself, oh, my God. And I was a tither. So I was thinking, if I tithe, I don't know, $100 sold to the highest bidder. He said, yeah, we'll go for that. It's like, son of a sushi. I should have sent $10. <laughs> hey, that fast. Okay. 
You know that paying $100 on $750,000 is like you spitting into the world. It's not going to even matter. It's like, but they don't care because at least they got you to acknowledge the debt. And this person, I told them, call them up and offer them something every month. Oh, I don't know. And you know what they told me? I called them up. I was like, got the courage to call. And they said, how much do you want to pay? I said, $100. And they said, okay. And I was thinking to myself, you could have said 10 Anyway. <laughs> well, you know, 30 months they paid off, right? For me, $100 on 750000 hmm. 7,500 lifetimes, I don't know. But the power of tithing brought that debt down by a quarter of a million at a time. Yeah. They forgave a lot of the debt. I couldn't believe that the IRS forgives you if you make regular payments. That's, maybe that's helping somebody in here. How many of you owe money to the IRS? You go in jail. No, nah, I just play. You're not going. You just got to make some kind of payment plan. You just got to figure it out. Or you got to... Take care of the church, and the church takes care of you because we have tax-deductible donations in the church for various services and donations and cash offerings. Amen. So if you're a person that no can write on your seed envelope, you're not getting tax credit because I no can read chicken scratch. Amen. Ask her. She no can read your chicken scratch. She interpreting. She don't know. She's like, oh, this look like shuja la 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 la. But well, we can read all your prayer requests. Oh, you make that clear. Pray for that. Oh, oh, calm down. Anyway, now if you like tax credit, let us know. Amen. Now we're going to be moving to church soon. You know, you can you can even get credit for that. Some you, nobody asks for credit for that. They're just like, nah, I love Jesus so much. I do him for free. What get for lunch though? What? Nah, we always buy lunch or something, amen. I always buy you on baki sushi or something. We take care. On spam musubi from, I don't know, Kyokawa Market, dollar seventy nine. I found out the old man at Poke to your taste is only dollar. It's like what? What is the difference? Yeah. How many you eat spam musubi? You like spam musubi? You ever got to make fundraiser? Go poke it to your taste. One dollar on a heat charge. You can still make one more dollar and you never have to work. And just ignore the old man's fingernails and you're all right. No, nah, I just played. <laughs> I just play. That's only plain. That's free flavor. Stop. And his dentures no feel good, so when he talking tap 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 tap, it's just flavor. Hopefully nobody came talk story where he's rolling them. I'm just playing, but to me that's the best deal in Hilo. Yeah. Good deal, amen. I ate there one time. I was like, wow, I'm impressed, and I never had a hankering for spam musubi ever. After that, I don't know why. He he more than satisfied my flavor profile for spam musubi. Some of you going tomorrow, no lie. Hey, for one dollar, come on, you ate way worse things for way more than one dollar. Ah, no. Hallelujah. Yeah, tell the truth. <laughs> you, ate the, you ate the Kobe, fell on the beach. You remember that? Pa, 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 pa. Still good. Uh, that's where the homeless guy was sleeping last night, right there. <laughs> I just, no, I'm not. Anyway, it's all fun and games, amen. And you are what you eat, so you dirty, go eat the dirty stuff. You're all right. <laughs> yeah, I'm a person that loves a good deal. How many of you like a good deal, right? You like go pay a dollar seventy nine. That's up to you. But for almost twenty one more cents, he don't even charge tax. Twenty one more cents, I get two, and you get I don't know what you get over there. I don't can see them behind the screen, but I can see Uncle right in the front. Hello. All right. You guys good? Now, 
this one, First John four seventeen and verse eighteen. Take a look at this, and I'll show you an opposite here that a lot of people don't see. Amen. All right. Ho 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 ho. Too fast, you guys. All right. Okay. Ho ho. I'm gonna move my head. Okay. What does it say? Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have. Boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, boldness in the day of judgment, a lot of people like to look at, oh, one day we got, we're going to be judged. Like, what are you worried about? You're seated at the judgment throne already. So who's going to be doing the judging? Hallelujah. Boldness in the day of judgment. That just means you have courage that when it comes to the day of judgment, you will know before everybody else, you have insider information that you are seated in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. So when everybody else thinks they got to line up for judgment, you're sitting on the judgment throne in Christ Jesus saying, Nanny, nanny, boo, boo. <laughs> what else can you say at that point? What are you going to say? You guys stupid. Eh? <laughs> now look. Oh, you have boldness because you know already that he was judged at the cross for you. When he went into the tomb, he took you in with him. When he came out, you were you resurrected and came out with Jesus. Whether you were born or not, you're all good. Amen? So what is your boldness? Let's just say boldness is another word for common sense. That we may have common sense in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Now that means he's already, oh gosh. Do you guys not catch that? Where are we? In the world. Because as he is, so are we in this world. That means that we are seated where? I don't know. Some people get a hard time with English. You know what I mean? When any preachers get a hard time, they struggle with English because love has been perfected among us. So been perfected is past tense. It means already happened. Already been perfected among us in that we have boldness in the day of judgment. The day of judgment was when Jesus was on the cross, hanging there, being judged for all the sin in the world. It pahanabra. You guys know what Pahanabra is? Pahanabra. Because as he is, so who is he? Is he? Huh? What is Jesus now? Seated at the right hand of the Father. Where are you seated? In him. So you're already that in the world. It means that whatever you say, boys and girls, is going to happen. You don't like how it's happening? Watch what you say. All right. I say that almost every service. Now, verse 18 is a funny thing. It says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is fear. Amen. How many of you love somebody? Are you fearful they're going to leave one day or are you hopeful? (laughs) <laughs> you love them because you love them, right? They, whether they go, stay, no go, whatever. Some of you going to go home and your love going to be on the couch. Hey, man, they're there right now, not listening to Spreaker. Right? I don't know what they're doing. Whatever they're doing, they're playing with the remote control. Anyway, I, I can tell you the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is fear according to that amen remember something if you are so filled with love you don't fear anything in this world yeah the early christians were notorious they would throw these christians into the arena with lions that haven't eaten in weeks and days and months and you know what they weren't fearful they would just huddle together and pray and whatever happened happened amen so hallelujah what are you fearful of Oh, I'm scared I'm going to lose my job. That might be the greatest blessing you ever get. Maybe you're supposed to lose that job so that God can get you to another job or get you home so you can spend more time focusing on Him for a little while and then He give you the next promotion. Don't ever fear anything. Oh, I got cancer. I'm like, bah, what? And what? What are you going to do? Some people, maybe you just got to entertain right now. If you don't have cancer, start living your life like you don't want it. You don't have to fear it. Just live better. Amen. Now, nah, bro, we eat no all day. Hey. I don't know. I can tell you what cancer loves to eat. It loves to eat sugar. 
So whenever cancer is there, you got to watch your sugar intake. Right? How many of you are smart like that? What is sugar? Well, the baseline of sugar is rice, potatoes. So you got to watch that. Amen? Anything white, so hallelujah. Payday bars are out because the wrapper is white. <laughs> That's one of my favorite candy bars. Right? Uh-huh. Shame, shame, she said. I don't live by fear, bro. Give me five. Anyway. Well, the thing is, you just got to be a little smarter, right? You know what I mean? You just got to take care of you. All right. Hallelujah. You guys all good? So in your notes now, perfect love casts out fear. And you see it in the scripture. And here it is in your notes. Perfect love casts out fear. The third hindrance to change is rebellion. I don't want to change. Well, hallelujah. Some people learn behavior as time goes on and they don't want to change. They like how it is. So I know that you got to like change. You got to like a change in environment sometimes. How many of you take a vacation and you go someplace else? I'll tell you why. It's because you like to see something different. So that in and of itself tells me that you like change. You don't like long-lasting change. Otherwise, you would move there. But most of you cannot live at the California Hotel and Casino. <laughs> Try pick someplace else for a change. You know, every time I stop in Vegas... Hallelujah. Everybody say, you went California. No, I went Las Vegas. No, I mean California Hotel. No. That would be like me getting up early and going to McDonald's and seeing all the people. Anyway, you guys know what I mean? There's a lot of elderly, older people there from Hilo and Honolulu and Maui and Kauai, and they all look the same, and they all talk the same story, and they all, and how you did? Ah. How you did? Ah. And then you tell them, oh, so what? You ate? Yeah. What you ate? Chicken katsu. What? What you ate? Oxtail. What? You can get oxtail right here in tongue. They go, they spend thousands something dollars for all over there for eat chicken katsu. And oxtail. And come back with beef jerky. Like Walmart, no more beef jerky. And they give you all shortbread cookies. The kind that you know what? Most of you on your worst day make better shortbread cookies than the one you bring home. Yeah, the one that look like playing card shortbread. And you're like, um, eh, pfft, junk. But you eat them because it's free. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, I went... I went, the first time I ever went to Vegas, the Dunes Hotel was being blown up. They were imploding the Dunes Hotel. So yeah, I was at the California Hotel because somebody had bought me a package. It was my first trip to Vegas. So I only had to pay a portion because somebody canceled. So I went and I was telling people, hey, we should go down. Let's go down the strip and go watch it. Like, far. <laughs> you know how far it was? Like from here, probably to Suisan Bridge. And they were saying, oh, too far. Why are you not go see that for? Because it's a once. You know, that was the first hotel they imploded, was the Dunes Hotel. 250,000 people went to go watch. But all the people at California Hotel never go. You know what the thinking was? Too far. <laughs> and the other reason they never go is like, nobody playing in the other casinos. We get better chance. And they're like, why you like go over there for? We can watch them on the TV right here. That's a true story. The three main reasons they use. And I was like, oh my God. So I went outside from the strip and I started walking down there. There's a lot of people and I could see it off in the distance. I got to see it implode. And I'm like, well, that's a fine. How do you do? I got to see a hotel blow up. Then I went back to the hotel, and the people I was with, I asked, uh, they asked me, so what? How was? I said, was mean. <laughs> mean. should have seen them. Because you got to make it sound way better than it really was. Right? You know what they all said? Oh, was mean. <laughs> Bruh, was mean. <laughs> 
And you look, they always say, oh, I thought I was going to win. That's why I never go. I lose. Hallelujah. I remember going to Fremont Street. We never have Fremont Street. It was just the street where cars could drive back and forth. You know, and all manner of weirdos over there. Now they're still weirdos, but you have a roof over them now. Hey, I saw a guy in his BVDs playing a guitar. I was like, I don't know about this one. I don't know. Some of you get better chance than that guy. He had cowboy boots and he was playing rock and roll with an electric guitar. I was like, what's the attraction here, son? <laughs> He's just making money. Gross. Yeah. People will do anything for money. But Hawaii people will do anything to lose money. <laughs> I remember going to the Four Queens and they said, Hundred dollar buy in slot tournament, you can win thousand dollars, and all these guys are like, Oh, bro, buy in, hey, we all go play. Thousand yeah, dollars for hundred dollars. Well, three prizes, everybody's a loser. The casino made more money than they got because they had 200 something people playing. I was like, I'm just doing a simple math here. The casino make 20, 20,000, then they pay out thousand five hundred and two fifty, I think it was. Hey, this is the greatest money-making venture in Hilo. We should do that. Uh, instead, we like sell lao lao. Yeah. Lao lao. Yeah. So people don't want to change. You know, the same people that were going to Vegas 20 years ago, still going now. Same story. Up, down, up, down, up. What are you doing? Push-ups? Anyway. But they love it, right? They love it. Then, you know. If you go to Vegas, go see something. I ask people all the time. They're sitting on the plane. In fact, this last time I went, there was an older Japanese man sitting next to me. I said, oh, so where are you headed? Oh, yeah, I go in Red Rock. Oh, Red Rock. Wow, that's different. I told him, oh, awesome. And he said, yeah, because I don't like see all the guys on this plane. I was like, how can we, what? Huh? He said, yeah, so I catch the limo, come pick me up, take me over there. I said, well, you know drive? I know drive. <laughs> no, let's look. <laughs> hey, rebellious, right? Because he said, I used to be scared drive, but then I didn't drive, and now I just don't like drive. I don't like drive because all kind maniacs out there. If Vegas has maniacs, what do we have over here? You know, over there, I've seen guys 70 miles an hour on the highway. Just wah, 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 wah. Over here, 7 miles an hour. I don't, I don't know what it is about Hilo. It's like everybody's a tour guide. Because every time they turn, they point into something. You guys have seen this? Have you been behind, been behind these tour guides? No more no tour sign, no more PUC license, no more taxi cab, no, no more. But they're always pointing out something. Either that or these tutus are practicing for the halal competition coming up. Uh, because they're always making hand motion to something. I don't know what they're doing. Hallelujah. She's having a conversation with herself in the mirror. You can't even see their head, you just see their arms. Like palm trees waving down their front. I don't understand. <laughs> Rebellion. I don't want to change. People in Hilo don't like change. That's why I don't know what everybody's squawking about. You know, our senator is trying to increase the speed limit on Saddle Road. You ever been on Saddle Road? When you get aggravated. Beautiful, wide road, wide shoulders, and every, dri every driver is trying to go 45. And in the 40 mile an hour zone, they like go 25. I don't know what this speedometer is saying. Yeah, I think so. Everybody's scared of the speed trap. Oh, the cops are out there. If everybody drive the speed limit, it might be all right. I don't know. Give the cops nothing to do. And how bored does he have to be to stay up there all day in the cold? Yeah. Hallelujah. I know some people, they, they say, well, I have my radar detector. 
Radar detector. Portuguese radar detector. Do this when you drive past him. <laughs> Just make shocker as you go back. Like, hey! well, that was 100 miles an hour. This must be my cousin. First Samuel 50. <laughs> Yeah. All right. You can see this. Verse 1 through 9 first, right? Here it is. Samuel also said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel and how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek. And utterly destroy all that they have and do not. You guys see that? So what is God telling him to do? Oh, but God is love. Anyway, God is telling him to kill everybody, everything. He says, but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox, sheep, camel, donkey. He describes every kind of human. Some of you guys are slow. You're like, what? What? What he said? <laughs> so Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telaim, 200,000 soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, go, depart, get down from among the Amalekites unless I destroy you too. Basically, right? So he gave some guys grace and told them, hey, brothers, beat it. The raid coming. All right. <laughs> yeah, you guys all read the paper, huh? Okay. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Canaanites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul attacked the Amalekites from Havilah all the way to Shur, which is east of Egypt. He also took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. Hello. What happened? And utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared a guy and the best of the best of the humans. Look at the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good. And were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. Okay, now we can go down, right? Keep going. Hallelujah. You see the title already. He's rejected. Verse 22, right? And 23. So Samuel said this to him after all of this thing. Has the Lord as great delight? Whoa, hello. All right, I know. In burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Remember that. No matter what you give, I mean, no, it's better to obey the Lord. If God tells you to give this guy $1, you give him, nah, I get $10. I mean, no, it's not accurate, right? And then he goes on to define this. Rebellion is like this. It says the sin of witchcraft. So what is rebellion? It's the same as witchcraft. So don't be rebellious because you, you're operating as a witch. Some of you ladies better get that together. Though. <laughs> and stubbornness <laughs> is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you've rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. So don't be disobedient. If the Lord tells you to do something, I mean, you just do what he says. Don't do it. No need to do extra. You know, they were doing extra, right? They were trying, oh, no, what this little piggy said, wee, 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 all the way to my house. You know, they're trying to save the best, but God said, kill them all. Obviously, there was contamination somewhere along this. So he said, kill them all. First thing they never kill was the other king. Well, you know, that king wants to kill you, but you're going to spare his life. Is there something wrong with you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Kill him. Get him. Some of you are like, oh, God was ruthless like that? Yeah. God was ruthless. You never have one wife named Ruth. Oh, boy. Anyway. So rebellion again. I don't want to change. This is in your notes, right? And then, what is the next line? Let's read that together. Hang on. It's coming. Saul disobeyed God and his rebellion cost him his kingship, anointing, and destiny. Amen. Oh, well, you know, you got to be obedient to God too. If God puts you in a lineage, you got to stay there. 
Don't say, they hurt me. They offended me. I go into this church now. Well, God put you here because you obviously got to learn something. Amen. What do you learn? To be part of a well-functioning family. I mean, you know, well-functioning doesn't mean that everybody's well-functioning. Amen. How many of you ever been to another church and you left there because a bunch of idiots over there? Well, you know, maybe you was the biggest idiot. <laughs> I'm not saying that you made a bad choice in coming here, but you can learn. If you're here now, stay and grow. Amen. Even Pakalolo is not fine before it's time. We will serve no wine before it's time. And what do people in church do the most? Wine. Wine about everything. Too hot, too cold, too dark, too light. You know what he did to me? You know what he said about me? You know how they will look at me? Just come in here with horse blinders, sit down and shut up. Just listen. <laughs> I don't know, I, I just say it like it is, eh, man. Because I've been part of churches where it just aggravated the heck out of me. You know what I noticed? There's severe in rebellion in a lot of churches because I meet some of these people. I haven't been to their church in 20 years. I just ran into somebody I went to church with 20 years ago. He still act the same. It's like, oh my goodness, still talking the same. I was in line. He was in front, and I was listening. He was talking to this person, the same stuff 20 years ago. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, oh. Bro, like, let's migrate into common sense and just say, praise the Lord. You know, God is good. God bless you. You need to talk all Jesus. On. Uh, you know, this Christianese got to stop already. They're all talking Christianese over there. They're talking all hyperbolical. Get two Christians together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, how time say hello? Because they see each other, you say, Hallelujah. Hello, hallelujah. You cannot say hello? Hi? Everything got to be centered around God, Jesus, praise you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, bro, relax, man. You go to volleyball, you hear people talking like that. Oh, praise God. You guys came watch volleyball. Praise God. You praising God from a volleyball game. <laughs> Half the kids I coach don't know God, and I wish they did because they would pray before they came to learn how to play. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Amen. God is good. Well, the fourth thing is in your notes. Laziness. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like changing. Proverbs 6, verse 9 through 11. Take a fast look at this. You guys can see. You guys see? Hallelujah. Read it to me. Yeah. How long will you slumber, O oh sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep? This is like. You guys get the picture? Got to show proof. Huh? So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. It's just saying that these things will sneak up on you and take you. Take everything from you. Laziness. You guys know some laziness people? You know what the ultimate form of laziness is? Uh, you have a job and you don't like go. Or you have a job and you look for every possible reason to not have that job. Yeah. I'm not picking on anybody. I, I used to hate working too. Amen. The worst thing to be is a wage slave where you got to get up because you got to go because you got to go because you need that money and you need that money. Or is you going to be whatever kind of person? Well, I, was, I was there. Amen. God gave me something that I don't know if. I don't know schedule, but I get too much schedule. Well, thank God that people enjoy what I do. Otherwise, I would never wake up. I would be in bed all day eating Snickers. Hallelujah. 
Mm -hmm. What is your greatest hobby? Wouldn't you rather be doing that sometimes? But you go to work because you are a responsible adult with responsibilities to take care of and not... Yeah, okay. As long as you know. Well, just be happy while you're there and look for the people you need to reach while you're there. Amen? And go home. You know, I know some people, they grumble about their workplace, but they go there, they basically go a little bit early, they carouse with their co-workers, they work all day together, then they go out and party all night. Like, what form of mental illness is this? You, you can't complain about the people you're hanging out with, you love to hang out with them, and then complain about them. Something wrong. Yeah. You have better success taking that paper clip from your couch and sticking them in the outlet. Then you can sing a Debbie Boone song. You light up my life. Oh, some of you guys are so young, I can't handle. All right. All right, laziness will lead you to poverty. Okay, you guys saw that one up there? And don't expect success if you're too lazy to study and apply the Word of God. Yeah, man. You want success? It's found in the Word. You don't like the Word? You know what your credits are? Is that you come to church and you at least get to study a little. Amongst all my sarcasm and humor, you learn a little something, something, which is good for you. Again, don't expect success if you're too lazy. All right? Number five, ignorance. You guys know this? Hindrance to your destiny? Ignorance. I've never thought about changing. Really? What do you, union worker? Not like leave. You know, being a union worker, that's fine. Amen? But there's some other job maybe that you can benefit from. Yeah. I know guys all the time, they migrate in and out of state jobs, you know? Because why? Because they like different scenery. They like different people to work with. I used to work at a jail. You know what the hardest thing I did all day was? Get up off the chair. Believe it or not, you get so accustomed to this position. <sighs> hey, mop the floor. And then they go, where the mop stay? It's supposed to be over there, not over here. <sighs> now I got to open the closet, look for the mop. That was the hardest thing all, I did all day besides tossing cells and looking for contraband or strip searching people that I did not want to see naked. <laughs> like, yikes. This, are you alive? You look dead. You look like a cadaver. Anyway, well, that was the hardest thing you did all day. And I used to grumble and grumble. And then one day I had an epiphany. You know what that is? An epiphany? Like, an enlightenment. Like, I don't belong here. I think I should leave. You know, part of the biggest thing I ever did was quit the state job, pack up my little young family, and move all the way to Florida to go to school. That was the hardest thing I ever had to do. Yeah, homesick every day. Because I was moving to a place I thought was like Hawaii. When you get there, the day I got there was the middle of July. Yeah, Florida in July. Great move, wah. Anyway. Get off the plane, lightning storm. I'm like, oh, I went from Hilo to this. And I was thinking to myself, what manner of mental illness did I suffer from? And I noticed that the whole summer, every single day, there was lightning, thunder and lightning in the afternoons. And I didn't know that Florida in the summer is very humid. Where you're standing in the shade and you're sweating and you don't know why. And there's no way you can stop it. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was thinking to myself, homesick, like a home, like a home. But then I went to school, so I had to get in the groove, and I still miss home. So I tell you, this is the greatest place in the world to live, is Hilo, Hawaii. May not have the greatest people to live amongst, but it's the greatest place in the world to live. Yeah. And we're called, obviously, God brought me back to reach the people of Hilo. And I'm thinking to myself, one of us is not right. But, you know, every time I go on a trip, I get on a plane, and it takes off from Hilo. I miss Hilo already. I'm like, oh, my God. Hilo is like a drug. Addiction. And then I come Hilo. I get bored. I like go. So as I go, I like come home. He's like, what is wrong? Hilo, evidently, is like heroin. 
I'm just throwing it out. Anyway, but you know the one thing is God will use any person that is willing to go. So if you're willing to go, just tell the Lord, he'll make a way. But you got to have something to say when you get there. So you better study. Amen? And you better have something to operate in because people will expect you to operate in something. You cannot just go, I'm here. What you need? I don't know that. What you like to learn? I can teach you that. I never study. <laughs> I like offering though. He don't work that way. He got to have something. Amen. It's, like, it's funny to me that there's a lot of naysayers you know, in our town. They like to say this kind of stuff. Well, well why does God use you? Well, evidently because I study the word, I have something to say when I get there. And I use the gifts here in Hilo. So when I go there, I'm already honed. I can use the gifts there. And you know, Hilo has the most projects of any place in the world. Mental projects. I can tell you the truth. You can minister to people from Hilo. You can reach anybody on the planet. Because the most complex thinkers in the world come from Hilo. You know why? As soon as you say something, somebody asks you a question. This is the process of knowledge is what I'm finding. You say, oh, I was dumb. And then what? Oh, yeah, I was hanging out with someone. And what they say? And then I was driving down there, and we went. And then I was, Paul was going, on, what time you got home? It's a constant quest for knowledge in Hilo. Evidently, everyone has these questions. You guys know what I'm talking about? If you tell somebody, oh, check out this bag. How much was that? Where you bought them from? Who was the cashier? Was it Mary, Mary Ellen, Jennifer Jackson? Eh? Yeah, everybody... <laughs> Man, everybody's so inquisitive in Hilo. Huh? But if you tell them, here, yeah, I can borrow $20. Oh, blah, blah, I lost my wallet this morning. My kids took all my money. I don't know. Look like a cigarette smoker looking for their light. Oh, I don't know where my wallet I would give you, though, but I don't can find my wallet. What are you doing? Self massage over there? Yeah, you guys know, right? People always have a question on top of anything you say. Yeah? People do that all the time. That's why I told you I, I'm weary because of words. People do words, words, words. The first question people ask me when I minister, so what, busy today? <laughs> yeah, but not too busy. I came. I'm here. Let's. Why you ask me if I'm busy for? You know I'm busy. Right? And where you at? Oh, yeah, man. I, so I stopped saying it because people ask me, oh, you, I, I saw you done the kind. You was ministering to the kind with the kind. They get the kind, eh? They get the kind, kind, kind. But you was ministering to the kind. Because I saw you done the kind. They used the kind. Bro, what's up with all the questions? My God. Relax. I don't tell anybody, amen. You guys are all special in your own way. Some of you have that designation on your life. You're special. So I keep it that way. You're special. I just leave it at that, amen. So all of you have benefited from this ministry evidently, amen. All right. Give me $100. I need Cheetos. I ran out. The Comedians gave me Cheetos. I ran out already. Nobody paid me in Cheetos lately. <laughs> My favorite gift, along with a hundred dollars. Anyway, I, uh, Cheetos. I like when my teeth all orange. <laughs> now I know why rats like cheese. Oh, yeah. Ignorance is not an excuse for not changing. Yeah, man. You guys agree with that? All right. You know what you should do. You should change. I don't know how for change. Oh, my God. Everybody in here, change is all about every day. Amen. If you go home the same route that you came to church every single time, you have mental illness. <laughs> Some of you know about choice. You got to go Hamakua, right? <laughs> but... And I say this because I experienced this, okay? When I worked at the jail, 
they will tell us this, okay? When I went to basic recruit class, okay, in corrections, it's like, you know, police, you know, in the recruit class. So you go to this class, and they tell you right in the class, don't take the same route twice every day, amen? Because somebody may be laying in wait to ambush you to extricate their family or their gang member or whatever. So don't take the same route. Okay, guess what route they take? The same route every single day. Every single day. Straight down Hailey Street to Bayfront, all the way across Pawahi Street up to the court. Hello. You wanted to ambush on Joe Van? Right there. Every day. And you know what? Every day, same route. And you know what? Everybody wave. Hey, Joe Van. Every day. I remember they would give us post assignments and my route for anywhere from a week to a month, depending on the shift, I'd be the van driver. We drive and I would tell them, hey, you know, recruit class, hey, we're not supposed to take the same route. They go, just take the same route so we know if anything happened to you where we can find you. I have a radio. I'm on Wai Nui Nui this time. This is the kind of loony bin place that you're working at. You got to take the same route. But in the school, they tell you don't take the same route. I mean, you know, that's what ignorance is all about. Yeah, ignorance. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> people are people, man. Nobody said people are smart. Amen. So you be the smart one. Amen. How you do that? Well, do something different sometimes. Try something. Now, I wasn't trying to pick on you because they come the same route every single time to church, but how about enjoying a different view this time? Huh? No? So, oh, Pastor, that's more gas. <laughs> anyway. Some of you never see Bayfront in months. Get on a brand new road, you know. They went repave Bayfront. <laughs> what? Powder construction. <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> and you know, be front, get one king come here, a statue, you know. For real, I'm not joking. <laughs> Everybody has to do something different, amen. How many you drink the same brand of coffee every single day? How many you eat the same cereal every day? Same breakfast, no, I gotta eat the toast, and I gotta, I gotta spread the butter four times. <laughs> Not five, four. Gotta take eight bites. Gotta read the paper. Gotta lay out the same way. Some of you read the paper in the bathroom. Right? And people knock. Hey, how long are you gonna be there? When I piled up paper. Anyway, Sundays is a bad day. That's why you don't come to church. Long year process. You got to try something different every once in a while. Amen. You know you live on a place where people pay to come visit, right? To look around at all the things that you're not even looking at. You know what tourists always say? Oh, my God. Hilo. I've been to Hilo, especially when I go away. They say, I've been to Hilo. Oh, my God. Everything's so green. And you know what we think? Bloody rain. That's why I stay green. Rain too much. That's why get mold in my joints. That's, uh, that's how we think. Right now it's dry, right? They said El Nino, you know, November, December was raining. Now it may be dry until close to summer. So tonight was drizzling. About, oh, I don't know if I can go to church. Raining. Read the paper or something, man. Oh. Somebody, I heard so, somebody say, Hey, how come Obama not running in the election this year? I just heard this. It's like, are you for real? Okay, come on. Why is Obama not running in the election? His terms about two-term maximum, man. This person, the person told them, because you're looking run already. Pa, what? Only four years, eh? Yours, you know, that's ignorance, right? Two terms. 
And then the brother said, oh, yeah, that's right. I went vote twice for him. Yes, yeah, right. You actually voted four times if you went to the primary, right? And this person, you know, they said next, well, maybe next time he can run again. OMG. You can't run again. You're done. Once you're the president two terms, you're done. Amen. You cannot run again. But you see how ignorant people are? Yeah. I tell this story all the time. You remember when the store in Kona opened? Lowe's, you guys remember? Two Portuguese in line at Long's now. Two Portuguese. I'm standing in line. Money my own beeswax. And then one Portuguese said, Oh, bro, I went to that store in Kona, bro. Oh, mean. What store is that? Louis. And the other Portuguese says, not Louis, it's Lois. <laughs> Two out of three ain't bad, huh? <laughs> if it was one Chinese guy known as Laos, it's my cousin. It's my cousin. From the homeland, it's my cousin. Lao. And then we get low. Mm, low international. Not so international. They get Korean hot dog. I don't know. <laughs> Cheapest meal in Hilo. Korean hot dog and rice. Two forty-five. <gasps> what? Uh, no line up. They close Wednesdays. How do I know these things? Because I live Hilo a long time. <laughs> Got to pay attention. I took that route. So it's closed Wednesdays. <laughs> you can take many routes in Hilo. You guys know this? Eh? No turn right on Manono right now from Lanikao, Lasai, Kawili. Stay close and then you're going to get lost. Oh my God. Now how I supposed to go to church? Turn the car around, honey. We no can go. They block our only route. <laughs> you know, Hilo, I believe that we as a church, you guys want to make some money? We should have and create the Babouge Festival. And once a year, everybody come together and tell their most famous story of the year. Yeah. And Frank D. Lima can come, put the two quarters in his head and call him Portuguese headquarters. So I mean, you're going to catch that later. That was his poster, right? He had two quarters on his head. He called him Portuguese headquarters. Some of you are looking at me blank, like, what? Why? What does that mean? I don't, I don't get it, Pastor. What are you talking about? Portuguese with headquarters. <laughs> Mumbai, you learn. Yeah, God is good. <laughs> ignorance. You run into ignorance all the time. Anytime you talk to somebody and they go, ha? Ah? Ignorance. Right now. On full display. Because even if they know the answer, they go, <laughs> So these people do that. I'm like, oh God, I'm out of here. Why? Because they can act like they don't know. And then the story going to be told again. <laughs> oh boy. Just go down. You can see Babouge Row at McDonald's. Right in you walk in the door in Walmart. Boom, they're all there against the wall. Ding dong, kong, jabong, and ling a lang. And they look, they start whispering about you. Praise God, hallelujah. Because they all go to this one church with the firstborn of the Kyokaha Lamb of Jesus Christ and Latter day Saints. They all get these long names for churches that longer than the wall that the sign is on, he go around the building. I promise, I, I've been to some of these churches. They invite me, oh, we're going to have a revival. I remember when I was a young pastor, I thought I had to go to every invite. They made. Yeah, you should come, we're having a revival. Okay, I go there and it's night of the living dead. All of them, they all need to be revived. They all go, standing on the promises of God. Soon and very soon. We are going to see the king. And one tambourine in the background. Ching, ching, ching. Oh, these guys all need an injection or something. B12 or something. They need ice. They need crack. They need speed. 
These guys come in all wind up, man. Like they drank wine all afternoon. On the promises of God. We're going to get the chariot ready. Oh, my God. And my friend was over there. Brah, you know, love these old hymns. I said, I'm looking around. It's almost all old hers in here. All old ladies with their mo mo and that. These ladies wearing these fake flower in their hair get more dust than flower already. Huh? Aye, that thing gets so much hairspray on top, it's brown, the flower. But you guys know hairspray attract dust, and over time, look, the flower look rotten. It's not poor Kenny Kenny. It's poor Daddy Daddy. Anyway. Tell you, these churches exist in our town. You know, this is Kahu la 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 ke aloha o kalani matsumoro cabreros olivera. That's all her ex husband's names, all in one. <laughs> she never bought a for change. None of the ex's last name, they're all in there because either they ex by dead or ex by wed. They just. And she kept them all just in case she like catch somebody, huh? I was married to an Oliveira. It's my third last name. Okay. Hallelujah. Yeah. I don't go to these, needless to say. I'm perfectly comfortable with you, Lolos, like me. <laughs> We're all good in here, right? All right. Huh, huh. You guys need more stories of ignorance? Or I got to keep going? Mm-hmm. Yeah. God is good. Amen. All right. The uh, funniest thing I saw in Honolulu this past week was a golf cart with a Honda generator engine and a bugger go 90 miles an hour. I was like, this brother got up early one morning and he thought to himself, I'm going to make the fastest golf cart. <laughs> and I know how. This is a true story. That's Ulu's cousin. <laughs> nice. It's beautiful and everything. And it's hiked up this high. It's high. So you got to, you ladies, no more chance. You're wearing skirt. That's it. All your goods and bads are going to be out. And he went down the road. I was like, okay, because that's legal. I'm like, nice golf cart. I wanted one. I was like, but where would I ride it in Hilo? Because Hilo's cops are so bored. They're like, arrest you for everything. As soon as I start them up, they'd be like, oh, hallelujah, get in. Now. You're under arrest. I'm like, what? All I did was start them up. It's illegal in this town. You better watch out. I know a lot of policemen in this town, and they love to give tickets. Love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it, love it. But you know what they hate to do because of laziness? They don't like to show up for court. So contest everything, you guys win them all. Just a little secret. Anyway. <laughs> Shh, edit that out, somebody. <laughs> so my friend told me, but I write plenty of tickets, but I don't show up for court whenever... The thing come, I just like, ah, whatever. If they're willing for fight them, they can have them. Okay, hey, that's good advice to pass on to all of you law-abiding citizens, right? When well, you're reading Big Island Popo Alert and Big Island Thieves and Popo Alert, that's a Facebook page, and eh? Dini, she loved that page. I see her post on that thing all the time. All the DUI guys know where the checkpoints take because everybody tell them, hey, no go la Nicole again, Popo, but yeah. Okay, well, evidently we all better stay home. All right. Don't be fearful, everybody. We're all good, amen. Hilo is still a safe place. Look at our church. It's so secure. The door is so huge. Anybody can roll in with a tank, one Mack truck, whatever. The danger to our church is more you guys smoking by the gas station. I got some news for you. Where we moving, you know, can roam around the building. It's security. A little clue for some of you. You cannot wander around the hallways. You're going to have to come church, sit down, shut up, and then when Paul go home, it's not like high school. You hang out after. You go home. <laughs> you know, <laughs> out, go home. You cannot wander around. Only one place you can smoke, up on the bridge. Pick a bridge. Get plenty in the area. Anyway. Mm. 
Are you guys figuring out where this is? Yeah, why local bridge? We're meeting at the old Helco plant. Okay, so order in a c o r t Anyway, yeah, we are moving. You guys know. I will tell you where, but you guys too near. I'm trying to keep you in the dark. And some of you like, tell me no. One of the aunties told me that, you better tell me where we're moving because I'm going to get, I'm gonna get mad. Good night. Calm down. Did you take your Prozac today? You need to just chill. Yeah? Pump your brakes and throw them in reverse because you just are just a little too rambunctious over here. <laughs> uh, you gotta buy them some Toscani so they burn slow. Okay. All right. The Word of God is accessible in so many formats. Everyone can get the information they need. Just go online. There's so many translations. Find the one that, uh, you know, makes sense to you. I read the Pigeon English one, guys. Don't even get it. That's a total waste of time. Whoever can translate that Pigeon, they don't can talk the kind like us kind guys can talk. They're all boss. They don't can talk good kind like us kind guys. If I sound more educated than you in my Pigeon... You have no business translating one pigeon English Bible. I talk pigeon in here all the time. And I go back on speaker and I listen. I'm like, oh my God, I talk like that? <laughs> I've got to practice my good English when I get to the mainland. But now that Google recognizes pigeon and Hawaiian, it's like, yeah, I, don't get, I can talk any kind of l i k e No matter. I s a s u r g e Google, translate that. Okay, I'll stand up.